A very warm welcome to one and all. Thank you all for joining our online morning lecture session, which is under India International Trade Fair virtual session organized by NSC. To brief you all about IITF, which is India International Trade Fair, it is the largest integrated trade fair with B2B and B2B components. It has emerged as the largest consumer's goods fair in Indian subcontinent. The format of IITF has business, social, cultural, and educational dimensions that are waved together. That are waved together uh, to explore their objectives. Several government organizations use this platform to spread awareness about their programs and policies among the public. NSC, in association with SEBI, is participating in the 40th India International Trade Fair from November 14 to November 27. The event is being coordinated by NSC in association with SEBI and other financial institutions for 14 days. Due to pandemic condition, the event is planned in online mode and offline mode for reach out larger audience. For online mode, we will be organizing sessions on various topics related to investor awareness from eminent speakers. The session will be of 15 to 20 minutes and, and we call it as opening lecture session and evening lecture session. For today's opening lecture session, we have Ms. Priya Subaraman, Chief Regulatory Officer, NSC. And the topic of today's session will be overview of regulatory requirements. To have a brief about ma'am, uh, Ms. Priya Subaraman is the Chief Regulatory Officer of NSC. Her responsibilities include inspection and enforcement, listing compliance, surveillance and investigation, listing approvals, member registrations and investor services. In a career spanning over 25 years, MAM has had various leadership roles in the regulatory and compliance space. Among other roles, MAM headed compliance for Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers in India. MAM also a director on the board of National Securities Depository Limited. Thank you, for MAM, for sparing time with us. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vaibhav, and uh, welcome and good morning to everyone who's, uh, who's attending the session today. Uh, just, uh, you know, um, you, you've already heard from some of my colleagues, I think, earlier uh, around uh, around what is NSC, the overview of capital markets. You probably also heard around what might be the new age uh, options for investment. You must have heard about uh, investor protection and uh, investor education and awareness. Today, I just want to set uh, the larger context on the regulatory requirements. I'll also talk to you a little about why the regulatory requirements, why do we need, uh, you know, why do we need uh, rules and regulations? And what are the rules and regulations that uh, broadly cover uh, the market, the, the capital market? So the capital markets is not just savvy and exchanges. So I just want to set the, larger, the slightly larger context as well. So let me, uh, let me uh, get started. Why do we need rules? The, the basic point about uh, rules is that uh, rules uh, and when rules are followed, the rules themselves and when the rules are followed, they actually uh, have, you know, uh, build trust uh, in the markets. That's that's the underlying point. The and, uh, and trust is, to my mind, the most important um, element of capital markets. If you cannot believe that the capital markets are behaving in a non-partisan uh, way, they are being run properly, then the idea of investing in the capital markets becomes that much more difficult. Probably it's a step which people will not want to take. Or even if they do take that step, it is, it's always with a little bit of hesitation and fear. So the idea of rules and regulations is really to set the, the boundaries and the parameters within which all players have to you know, behave. And uh, why do we do that? So let's think about uh, let's think about the economy today, right? Um, we know that uh, our prime minister has set out uh, the agenda for uh, the GDP of India to be a five billion, uh, uh, five trillion dollar economy. Now, where are we on that path? Uh, in terms of the GDP, we are at about two point, um, I think about two point five. We used to be about two point six seven. We've slightly tapered off, and I'm sure, um, but. From a broader context of uh, NSE, if you think about uh, the market capitalization of NSE, that has actually increased and exponentially in the last one, one and a half years. Um, you, and, uh, uh, and it is now in the region of about 3.4 trillion. So essentially what we are really saying is the capital markets are a, are a couple of things. One, apart from the fact that it, uh, that it is non-partisan and, and, and it is really... Um, 
you know, there is no one group that gets any preference over another group and so on. Everybody is equal in the capital markets. The other part is uh, the stock exchanges are really a barometer of the economy's health. What we can, uh, you know, one indication, and I'm not an expert, but uh, my idea of uh, when we think about um, the GDP and, and uh, capitalization is the fact that NSC's uh, uh, market capitalization seems to indicate where the economy is going. And therefore, uh, from that perspective, I think uh, we are headed on the right path. Just, just given, the, just uh, having set this context, let me go a little more into, uh, let me deep dive a little into the regulatory framework itself. I think most of you would have heard about uh, SABI. SABI is the Securities and Exchange Board. That's the direct regulator of the capital market. So that is the that's the primary regulator. The stock exchanges are also regulators, but in a sense, we think of ourselves as a frontline regulator and a quasi-regulator because we are not the ultimate regulator. The ultimate regulator is SEBI. But as I just said, um, you know, a little earlier, it is not just SEBI that's the regulator. There is a whole bunch of um, regulators in the ecosystem. So obviously, we have um, we have Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Because all companies, whether it is a broking entity, whether it is um, NSC, whether it is, you know, um, the the anybody who is listed uh, company, who is an unlisted company, everybody is governed by the Ministry of um, Corporate Affairs, MCA, and, um, and uh, the Department of Economic Affairs. So the point being that we should think about the, we should always think about the larger ecosystem. Whenever we are thinking regulations and capital market, I, I will dwell on it um, in a little more detail when I speak about RBI, which is the fourth uh, pillar, really. So uh, from a broader perspective, let's think of capital markets. Right? When we think about capital markets, one of the things that we think about is uh, what are the different facets that RBI could potentially be involved in? Uh, we have uh, currencies that are uh, listed on the exchanges. Therefore, clearly RBI is involved in that. There are bonds that are listed. Uh, government securities are deemed listed the day it is issued by the RBI. So RBI is involved there. Then we are all aware that uh, the, a lot of funding uh, comes into the capital markets. People can actually take loans in order to uh, you know, buy shares and securities or, uh, or otherwise participate in the capital markets. More often than not, that funding comes from NBFCs and banks both of whom are regulated by RBI. And one more aspect which I want people to think about, and uh, sometimes uh, people miss this, especially when they think uh, talk about the capital markets, is that there is a Foreign Exchange Management Act, which governs all sorts of uh, you know, uh, foreign um, investment into this country, whether it is in companies, listed companies, whether it is in um, whether it is foreign direct investment, whether it's a portfolio, um, foreign portfolio investment, whether it is foreign entities setting up broking entities, a whole variety of any foreign participation actually comes under uh, RBI's domain. Therefore, RBI is also a key player in the capital market space. So that's something which we should we should always keep in mind. Now let me go a little more into into little more detail around uh, you know the so companies act we spoke about we uh, what we said is companies act actually um, applies to anybody who's a company whether it is uh, listed unlisted but uh, the the question uh, naturally is that if there is a provision in the companies act and there is a provision in the sebi act uh, which uh, which one is more uh, you know what should i actually comply with the point is if there is a spe and this is the general um, you know law of the land this is the interpretation of statutes if there's a general law and there's a specific law the specific law uh, has uh, you know is hold supreme so therefore when you think about uh, the the um, regulation for listed companies which is listed you know lodr uh, listing obligations and disclosures and you think about Companies Act. If there is any if there is any contrary provision between these two um, uh, laws, what you will end up uh, what uh, you have to do is to actually meet the LODR. So that's that's really the context. And when we think about different laws and the interplay between the laws, uh, the way I would think about it is uh, we need to look at the SEBI law first. If there is any uh, contrary provision with any other law, SEBI law will will hold supreme. So that's that's really the um, underlying principle. Within SEBI laws, there are a lot of laws. So within uh, the overall uh, SEBI Act, there is obviously a whole bunch of laws which have been made. There are laws for brokers. There are uh, each market intermediary actually has a provision under which it has it has to register. Therefore, brokers, portfolio management, mutual fund, exchanges, clearing corporations, depositories. So there is there is a regulation which is made by SEBI for everything, for each of the intermediaries that are registered with it. 
and we have to we have to work within those particular boundaries now the intermediaries ex except for uh, the exchanges and depositories other intermediaries don't necessarily issue circulars so if you think about the broader uh, regulatory context you have the sebi act you have the whole lot of sebi laws under it and we'll talk about some more laws um, in a bit but under those laws there are further laws made uh, there could be procedural they could be substantive either way it is the market in so you know the the market intermediaries like stock exchanges like clearing corporations like depositories stock and commodity exchanges clearing corporations and depositories which actually make further laws other intermediaries follow what sebi has said and what their own uh, you know front line regulator or quasi regulator as it may as it may be they have actually said so that's really the entire um, provision or universe of laws now one question is the i have looked at the sebi act i have i've seen certain things i have looked at circulars of nsc let's assume for a minute you are a client of a broker i have looked at that i have seen sebi stock broker sub broker regulations i have seen all nsc circulars it's not covered what do i do one thing which we must keep in mind is there is also the overarching what is a law designed to cover so that is a question to ask yourself and therefore if if nothing is if if just because something is not permitted or pro prohibited it's important to see what is the context of the law in making a decision that's one thing which which i think it's important for everybody to understand i will talk about the why i'm saying this in a bit the second part is there are other sebi regulations that apply even to everybody irrespective of whether you are an intermediary whether you are a client whether you know whatever is your the moment you are an investor in the capital markets or, or you are doing any trade in the capital markets it is applicable to you what are those laws one of the key things is prohibition of insider dealing so that is something which everybody should keep in mind the other is uh, sast what we call as uh, sast or takeover code takeover code uh, frankly only applies uh to an investor if they are really a large investor or they are a person uh, you know acting in concert with a large investor but prohibition of insider dealing applies to everybody and to the ex and uh, to the extent that and pro prohibition of insider dealing is one of the laws in which one can actually be prosecuted so therefore it's uh, it's uh, applicable to all investors and it is it's important that everybody understands what are the various aspects of uh, that particular law the third one and as a client therefore you know there may be uh, there may be a lot of people here on the today's attending today's morning session who are clients so therefore the one other law which i think is extremely important when you are a client when you are a client of a broker when you are participating in the capital markets is unfair trade practice there are times when and so uh, you know uh, in the introduction why i've mentioned that um, parts of what uh, the regulatory division of nsc does is also surveillance and investigation in the course of doing that surveillance and investigation we actually speak to uh, clients to ask them clients is or anybody in the market who's investing or who's trading in derivatives or currency or whichever other product so we have actually asked these people that what is it that uh, you know um, what is the reason for this trade why have you put this trade did somebody give you any information did you get any tip if you did why did you go for this you know because tips also can be as i just said potentially if if a company insider somebody who's um, who's close to the company who's a key management personnel of the company who's a director of the company if they actually give you information and you trade on that that's a problem therefore there are multiple times when we ask people why did you buy this stock why did you sell this stock did the broker tell you something did somebody else send you an sms saying that the stock will go up we ask multiple questions now cast clients investors should keep in mind that prohibition of um, the you know um, uh, prevention of unfair trade practice also applies to them they, all these laws are not just for the market players in, in you know as brokers or sub brokers now authorized persons it applies to everybody and therefore two laws which almost everybody uh, should should keep in mind one is insider dealing one is unfair trade practice in terms of so if we were to think about uh, the the regulatory uh, space uh, let us you know if we were to think about the regulatory space of, around what i said what is it that uh, the regulator wants to do why again uh, we already spoke about the fact that regulation and boundaries are there in order to build trust but what do these rules really achieve 
So there are two kinds of things that uh, we need to think about. One is the fact that some of these rules are designed to prevent certain things from happening. So that whatever is incorrect, whatever is a, a wrong practice should not happen at all. To the maximum extent possible, one would try for uh, prevention. However, every single, uh, you know, bad practice or unfair practice or whatever, whatever other, um, you know, um, undesirable practices, so to speak, in the capital markets, everything cannot be prevented. Some have to be detected. So there are a whole bunch of uh, law, laws and regulations which are actually meant for detection. And those, are, uh, th those would be some things which, um, which uh, the exchanges would do, the depositories would do, the clearing corporations would do, and SEBI would do. Sometimes we also receive, uh, you know, indications that something might be wrong from uh, maybe from the government, from other uh, agencies, including RBI, etc. But be that as it may, this is the larger responsibility of actually trying to either prevent an undesirable activity or to detect an, uh, an activity which might not be right is really left to the MIIs, uh, the, the market, um, you know, infrastructure um, uh, institutions, and it is left to SEBI. And in order to do that, so so as I as we just said uh, that uh, yeah, prevention is better. I mean th that's an old adage as well. Prevention is better than cure. But um, the point is, every time prevention is not possible. Sometimes, uh, depending on what the situation is, some things that were detection then become prevention because of the fact that the rules get changed. And I will talk about some of the rules in a bit. But one more aspect which I want to talk about is the fact that all of us, whether it is SEBI, whether it is the institutions, we also have a development activity. A betterment of the market uh, by having a lot more depth in the market, by having a lot more products for people to invest in, to trade in, is, is part of our development activity. Some of the rules are also which SEBI has brought out, whether it is interoperability, whether it is a T plus one settlement. Some of you may, may have read that T plus one settlement is also on the anvil. Those are also some things which are development activity. The idea is to, again, build, bring more uh, clients and investors in the market. Uh, um, one one uh, statistics I think you must have heard many times in the past is um, only 2% of the Indian public actually invests in the capital market. That has increased about 4 or 5%, but we are really a wrong, long way off. Uh, large um, countries, developed countries, have a hugely different um, different statistic. It's almost in the region of 30 to 40 percent. Therefore, from uh, India and um, investors' perspective, of course, a lot of uh, youngsters now seem to to put uh, money into crypto. But be that as it may, uh, from a capital market perspective, we we think that we are a long way off, and and uh, our development role is also, uh, you know, equally important to the regulatory role that we have. So, you know, at the end of it, I will be stopping in, an, in a couple of minutes or, you know, another five minutes. If uh, anybody has questions or, you know, any ideas to, to give, I'd be very happy to take them. So coming back to, uh, to what NSE does. So the one is, our, uh, one is our development role and the second is our regulatory role. Regulatory role um, uh, is both, as I said, preventive role and a detective role. I just want to focus a little bit on the past regulations which have happened for the past um, uh, couple of years. Uh, and uh, anybody who's an investor in the market, I'd really like to give uh, this message. Please don't give away your securities to anybody. Uh, the securities do not have the current uh, SEBI regulations and circulars of NSC and others. Make it very clear that when I say securities, I mean shares, bonds, mutual funds, anything that you hold in your DMAT account please don't give it away to any broker. You, If you want to buy shares, if you want to buy bonds, if you want to trade in derivatives, and you want to use the securities that you have as margin, it need not leave your account. That is one key change which has happened in the past couple of years. And that is for the protection of investors. Uh, you know, th that one, we used to actually find uh, after the fact, whether any security shares have been misused by the broker or by the depository participant, now we are, we've made it uh, a more uh, preventive control to say that the shares should not leave the account, period. It's as simple as that. So shares which should not leave your account when you sell the shares. There is a new uh, voluntary mechanism also which has been put into place by SEBI, which is, uh, and uh, and we are we are strongly encouraging everybody to take, um, uh, you know, ask your broker to, to give you that mechanism. It's called a block mechanism. It works like an ASBA, uh, uh, which, which is really a mechanism when you buy um, shares in an IPO. 
your money doesn't leave your account unless and until you know how much money you actually have to part with it doesn't depending or doesn't depend on the application it depends on allotment therefore in a similar way unless and until you have sold the shares and it is time for delivery you do not have to give the shares you do not have to transfer it to anybody as i also already said shares which uh, which you might share securities government bonds mutual funds anything that you might to want to use as margin for your transactions please don't let it leave your account it will remain pledged in your account itself so that is that's a very important and a very critical change which has come in the second thing which i want to talk about is we take a whole lot of information uh, from the brokers we being uh, the exchanges primarily nsc we take information from the broker of how much fund each person has given how much money each person each of his clients has have given him what is the trading etc however please remember that all that is post facto so therefore we will take that information with a little bit of a lag it's extremely exceedingly important for you to understand what is happening to your money so to that extent uh, importantly uh, you you must keep track of whether or not the money that uh, the broker you have given to the broker and which has whether it has been properly utilized you must ensure that the money that you have given to the broker comes back to you after a particular period the broker is not a bank he is not an nbfc he is not an intermediary where you park money you must keep the money with you you give it to the broker when it is required for him for margin purposes or when you are buying um, share securities bonds government bonds whatever it is that you are buying uh, through the broker make sure that the broker uses the money only for that purpose and he gives you the money back at the end of and there are many regulations which are now about to come we will do a lot of investor awareness programs as well so when nsc does do an investor awareness program i'd strongly urge everybody who's who's uh, you know logged in today to actually go through some of the programs suggest to us what changes we can make to make it more interesting and and make all of you more aware of what the latest changes are the important thing is we will do our best to protect client assets we want you to do your bit also to at least look at what what is happening in the market is the broker using your money properly is he using it for the purpose he said he would use so on and so forth Uh, one la- i i also want to talk a little bit about uh, the listing side so listed companies you know um, for a really long time listed companies uh, we did not have the kind of surveillance and uh, you know inspection and enforcement on listed companies now we have started the way we do uh, uh, surveillance of listed companies also is of a much higher um, you know what can i say quality than what we would have done in the past so you will see lot more changes in that space and uh, we have said at the start that there's a lot of things that um, that regulatory does so for just just to give some perspective uh, you know many of the orders that uh, would come out uh, um, from from sebi around insider trading front running a lot of the reports would have got done by nsc uh, if there are any questions in this space you might know of media recommendations report or you might have heard of some of some of the other names if there is anything that uh, you know you want to understand a bit more uh where the orders are already there in the public domain i am happy to speak about it uh and uh, again the some of our other functions are frankly more limited to the to the to the market intermediaries so i am really not going to talk about those uh i think you know by and large this is what i wanted to tell you uh, there are some more regulations coming uh, one of the regulation is uh, segregation of client collateral so that you know we can follow in a way we can actually follow the client collateral from the client to the clearing corporation so that nobody can misuse any of the collaterals whether it is funds whether it's security securities as i already mentioned to you should not leave your account at all so we are trying to do a lot of uh, investor protection uh, and client asset protection measures we will seek your cooperation also in making sure that those measures are successful um, i uh, you know we uh, lastly i just want to say one more thing nsc sends a lot of messages uh, to the to all the investors every every time you trade on nsc by the end of the day you would receive a message saying this is the trade this is a broker you would receive a message at the end of each week saying that this much um, funds are left with the broker as i said securities are supposed to be in your account but it is possible that you may have bought those securities and it is still not there in your depository account so those might be in the pool account of the broker etc that also you will you know you will get um, a listing both uh, through an sms and an email so uh, you know um, let us all be investors that are aware and let us all support in in moving the capital markets ahead uh, from a regulatory perspective sebi and the exchanges will do whatever it takes 
in our in order to protect the, uh, our investors i will stop here and i will uh, you know if there are questions i am happy to answer those uh thank you ma'am for such an insightful uh, session as we are live on various uh, multiple platforms so we have uh, received multiple queries so out of which if you allow uh, can we have some uh, queries to go ahead uh. yeah ma'am so first question is <clears throat> how nsc monitors compliance by brokers uh, so compliance by brokers is in two or three ways one is we go for inspection so uh, the sebi regulation says that uh, we must inspect brokers all the brokers at least once in 3 years so if you divide the total number of brokers by 3 uh, then uh, potentially we would uh, you know we would actually inspect 400 brokers a year in, in a comprehensive way we also do spot inspection suppose there are a whole bunch of complaints which have suddenly come in for a particular broker then we would immediately go there i mean anybody who's a who's a ca student or who's a chartered accountant would would know what snap inspections mean um snap audits mean so you know we would immediately go there so that also happens so that's that is a physical uh, presence at um, at uh, the brokers offices we also do things like offsite supervision so therefore as a, as i mentioned as part of my um, uh, you know discussion earlier that there's a lot of information that we take from brokers so part of what we do uh, with a little bit of time gap of obviously because this is not real time information uh, what we do is we actually take a lot of information from the brokers to see how the broker is functioning whether clients have paid margin whether a broker is actually giving shares back to the client for whom he bought so on and so forth so there are a bunch of um, uh, uh, red flags that we actually run the information and try to find so if there are any red flags for example if we find anything which you know which is not matching so for example uh, i have given money uh, it has been utilized but there are no shares in my account or there is no derivative transaction in my account so then immediately obviously the question has to be asked is what happened so whenever we receive a red flag we will actually then uh, you know um, as uh, this is called offsite supervision we actually will ask questions of the broker we will take some evidence and so on and so forth and trying to see what exactly happened so this is the way we uh, we uh, do this uh, separately uh, and this is strongly encouraged there are people who will come back and tell us what a broker is doing uh, sometimes in the market and then we will go and inspect the broker so that also happens so you know there are the sometimes there may be a practice which we may not necessarily be immediately aware of and uh, somebody might find it somebody would complain to us so th th these are the but on site um, uh, supervision that is at the broker's office and uh, sitting in our office and looking at certain information and churning what we call as off site supervision these are the ways in which we look at a broker uh, thank you ma'am one more question is related to the trade verification uh, how can an investor verify trades directly from exchange so there are two thing ways in which uh, an investor can do this so one as i said as part of my uh, the earlier discussion is that at the end of each day uh, uh, exchanges uh, nsc sends an sms to each and every client who has traded that particular day saying that this is the trade that happened on nsc today so all the transactions will be sent by way of an sms secondly trade verification on the website is also available for a period of about i think a week or 10 days so if so in both ways you can check it there will be an sms in your box so if for some reason you miss it or what for whatever reason you are not able to find it then potentially you can go on our website and check this but that's available for a particular period okay ma'am uh one last question that is related to the uh, listed companies a participant is asking do exchanges also take discipl disciplinary actions against non compliant listed companies Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, all of the action is available on our website. There's a series of actions that we take against listed companies. Some actions are penalty. Uh, some actions. Uh, so uh, then, after which uh, we actually suspend the company. Uh, the reason why we do that is because of the fact that if a company is not complying with the regulations, uh, more investors should not be caught in you know in in, in um, buying shares of that particular company or tr or trading in that company. So that's the second. so once the company is um, so be between suspension and um, penalty there is also putting that company into trade for trade so which means that uh, trade for trade is is a situation in which if i want to buy shares i must actually give the money i can't do a intraday trading that's that's pretty much the meaning of trade for trade and if i sell shares i have to necessarily give the shares so uh, then uh, we will suspend the company uh, and we will still continue to give a chance to the company to to you know shape up 
But if nothing else happens, we actually end up freezing the promoter shares or not only of that particular company, but let's assume for a minute, I'm a promoter of a company of 10 companies. If even in one company, I don't do the right thing, if I don't comply, then all my shares, after obviously giving a notice and, and um, uh, an opportunity for, um, for rectifying, all the, um, the shares, wherever I hold, will get frozen till such time as the non-compliance is uh, remedied. Finally, if the company is, has reached a stage where it is no longer uh, you know, correct to the, keep the company as a listed company, we will delist the company. And any compulsory delisting, uh, the promoter of the company is supposed to give an exit to the shareholders at, at the valuation of the company at that time. So at least there will be some valuation which, uh, which um, shareholders at that time can get. But these are the ways in which we do this. Uh, okay, ma'am. Uh, one last thing uh, that uh, we need to ask is that uh, any general piece of advice to investors so that their interests are protected? Uh, one very um, key uh, advice that I want to give everybody, there is no assured return or a fixed return in the capital markets. No intermediary is allowed to give it. Not a broker, not a PMS provider, not a mutual fund. Nobody can tell you that you will get this much return on, on your investment. So if anybody is telling you that or is trying to indicate a return, that is completely prohibited. We sh my my um, humble request to everybody is that please do not get taken in by any of these things. Uh, there is no such thing specifically uh, from a broker perspective because uh, as an exchange, we regulate brokers and uh, authorized persons who are you know in the nature of sub-brokers. Uh, there is no such thing as an assured return. No PPT. Please do not give any credence to any PPT which says that, you know, or any uh, flyer, any brochure, anything from anybody which says that this much return you will get. Those are all falsehoods. Please do not get taken in by any assured return. One last thing. If you did get taken in and the broker for whatever is worth is not returning your money or the money has been lost, you have no recourse to any of the exchange uh, platforms. So when uh, IGRC, you, you really don't have any recourse. And for any, for any reason, if the broker defaults and is expelled, then there is no protection from the investor protection fund either. Please do your homework. There's a lot of material available on what is the right uh, way and the wrong way. We are exchanges and depositories, all MIs are doing a lot of investor awareness programs. Please try and participate. We will try and make it as interesting and succinct as possible. But but be an aware investor. That's all I can I, I want to say. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful, insightful session. I am sure uh, this information that we shared will be very lucrative, very much uh, accepted by the participants, appreciated also. So uh, this brings to an end of our morning lecture series. We'll be again joining three at three with another topic and with another speaker. I am uh, thanking ma'am for sparing time with us, uh, providing us such an info informative uh, session. Uh, thank you all the participants for joining us and uh, we'll be joining again at three. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vaibhav, and thank you everybody for participating today.